CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Hey, everybody, Tim Graham and friends. We're back. Brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic. Joined by my usual co-host, Jonah Bronstein of the new Bronstein Times. And my old co-host. I'm sorry? Happy to be here. Oh, thanks. Thank, Great to have you. And uh, Matthew Fairburn, my old co-host. He of the athletic also. Were you with the athletic when you were the co-host or were you, were you with Syracuse.com? How many iterations of Matthew Fairburn have been on this show? We have Bill's writer for Syracuse.com, Bill's writer for the athletic, Patriots writer for the athletic, and now Buffalo Sabres writer for the athletic. I'm thinking I was on the show as all four iterations but i was never co-host until i got to the athletic because I, that seat was occupied by the the very large shoes of michael j rodak and so it couldn't have been until after rodak left right i don't think i spent some time with michael j at the uh, nfl scouting combine last week and he's actually lost weight and i think that that is because he is no longer in western new york <laughs> He looks like the guy that uh, we remembered from a few years ago, not the guy who left, uh, who was uh, sidled up to the Elmo's bar three nights a week and pounding wings and Bud Lights. Uh, I think that uh, his wife has put him on a stricter diet. He looks good. He always did. Covering the hell out of that Alabama basketball beat in addition to football. Yeah, isn't uh, Alabama to- the fattest country, fattest state in the country? Probably. I, I think don't. it is. Yeah, I think it is. That's Louisiana's like got to be up there. That would be tough to measure, I would think, but I can't prove it. Waistband. I can go uh, waistband uh, per capita. You can do Body some sort of percentage. algorithm of uh, waistbands, uh, waistbands sold in Alabama per uh, per person a lot. I don't know. Based you on age, rates of obesity. Either way, I think it's hard to prove. Yeah, I'm looking this up. It's West Virginia is the fattest state. Let's see where Alabama ranks. Not that high. Well, according to what? Seven. Seven. According to worldpopulationreview.com. Mike's also married to a doctor, so that uh, skews his um, his situation personally. I mean, the lifestyle was a little bit different before he had children, uh, but uh, he get gets married uh, to a doctor. Uh, he upgrades in life, moves to Birmingham, starts having children, Birmingham, <laughs> and uh, he's uh, he's taking care of himself. So anyway, it's good to see. It was good to see Mike. We're trying to get him on the podcast. We're having trouble scheduling the guy with, you know, scandals, murders, capital murders at that. Uh, NCAA tournament on the horizon, SEC tournament, of course, the combine. Alabama football is its own thing. Uh, He's just trying to keep his head above water, but we're trying to get him here on the podcast to talk about what's going on with Nate Oates down there at Alabama. And and, uh, everybody's always curious to what's going on with Michael J. Rodak, uh, his own self. He's got time to text all of us about 15 to 20 times a day, but he can't do a Zoom call once a week. That's true. If he would just not text... Uh, and just save all that time, we would be able to schedule something. Um, speaking of obese, um, Eric Comrie's goals against average uh, last night uh, was big. Uh, what can you say, Matthew, about that game? And I know that it's one that you kind of throw out 
Uh, but for a team that is trying to prove itself uh, as a playoff contender, uh, a team that is trying to show that it does belong uh, with the better teams in the NHL, uh, this slide that has been happening, uh, it, it was already depressing for Sabres fans heading into last night's game. Uh, and then Dallas puts 10 on uh, Eric Comrie. What, uh, what's your takeaway after uh, today's uh, practice at Harbor Center? Yeah, it was not not a great you know, 24 hour stretch there. It felt like, you know, there's probably still stinging a little bit from, from what happened on Thursday night. I feel like to an extent, the, there was a bit of a hangover from Tuesday night. I think they understood what they were getting into against the Islanders and the implications of what that would do to their playoff chances. If they had won that game uh, on long Island, losing it in the fashion that they did. It felt like some of that probably carried over into Thursday. And, you know, Kyle Ocposo mentioned that these guys, they, they understand where they are. And so there's a tendency probably happened against the Bruins as well. I think this might've been when Kyle mentioned it, that the game starts to get away from you and you're kind of already just thinking about the next game, but you have to finish the game you're playing, you know, and, it's part of what people don't like to hear over and over again, how young the team is, how inexperienced they are, but it is a fact of their situation. They are the youngest team in the NHL. They're playing in important games for the first time for a lot of these guys ever, uh, the most important games they've ever played in. And they need to get used to losing a game like Tuesday and just packing that away and being able to show up two nights later and play, you know, get back to playing the way that they did a week ago against the Lightning. So is it cause for concern about how they're building this team? I don't think so, but it's a major disappointment for a lot of people. I understand that it's a major disappointment that this team creeps into contention and then, you know, right when it feels like they might be able to pull it off, it seems like one of these slides happens. It happened, you know, with Columbus and Boston. Uh, now you're looking at what three straight losses. You know, at the beginning of the week, you're sitting there with 68 points. You got a chance to move up. Got a chance to be in the driver's seat, really, if you can beat the Islanders. You lose three straight games, and now Money Puck has them at four percent to make the playoffs. Uh, and it's because of how tough the schedule is. They're playing without Alex Tuck, which is not ideal he's one of the only guys on the roster that knows what it's like to play in the playoffs and seemed to be raising his game to that level right before he got hurt and so this is just kind of the reality of where they are i think they're they're not really much different a team in terms of where they are than the most optimistic expectations at the beginning of the year at, there were not that many people that expected them to make the playoffs, even the most optimistic of fans. I went back and read a prediction story I did at the beginning of the year and read the comments and because I had predicted them to get 85 points. And even the most optimistic people in there said, I think they can get to 90 or 95. But nobody was calling this a 100-point hockey team. I don't think they're going to get to 95, but 85 is within reach and improvement from last year is within reach. The playoffs are still a glimmer of a hope. So it's not, you know, a disaster, but it's uh, when a loss happens in that fashion, it's sort of, it's an attention grabber, as Don Granato put it, not just for the fans, but for the team to kind of figure out what, what the hell's going on. What do you think's tougher to swallow uh, at this stage? Um, and talking to both of you guys who cover this team, um, a loss to a good team like Boston when you're ramped up and you feel like, okay, this is a chance for us to prove what we have. Uh, we're, are we, do we really belong among the elites? Can we compete even if we were to get into the playoffs? Uh, are we looking at a sweep? Are we looking at, you know, can we sneak one through all that type of stuff when you play against a team like Boston uh, versus a loss to the Columbus blue jackets uh, where it's okay, guys, 
we got to get these points. We got to collect them. What do you think hurts more in terms of just the the psyche or or where things are uh, at this stage right now here, March tenth um, of of fighting for for relevancy? I would think it's the especially at home. I think it's the home losses overall, but the home losses to Columbus and earlier in the season the Coyotes. And if you hope and believe that the Sabres can make the playoffs this year. Those are the points they need to make the playoffs. And, and you don't really expect them to win on the road against Boston or have a good record against all of the top teams in the league. And they've beaten some of the top teams in the league and, and had some really good wins recently against the Tampa Bay Lightning that were encouraging for the fan base. But I also kind of wonder, I'm less worried about the team and how they're playing and where they're going and these growing pains. And I think maybe hitting a bit of a wall and struggling to finish the job this season they am about the fan base kind of reverting back to this, you know, dark place and really getting worked up and disappointed and, you know, upset that the Sabres aren't meeting an expectation that almost nobody had for them earlier in the season. And even throughout the season, other than the first few weeks, they haven't really been in the playoff position at all. They go on winning streaks and they get right to that edge and you can do some math with the games at hand and figure that they might be a playoff team but they've never really been solidly in the playoffs then when they lose games they fall you know where they are now a few points out they've kind of vacillated between those two spots so it isn't really like they were a good team that's sliding and you got to be concerned about their trajectory this is just how the season's been going they've had stretches like this all along they just you know they didn't give up 10 goals but they've lost three in a row they've lost disappointing games they've lost at home when they should have played better uh in just about every month of the year yeah, I think the to go back to the original question, like I think the losses to like Columbus and you know Arizona, like Jonah talked about, probably hurt for the fans more. But I really think that losing seven to one to Boston or ten to four to Dallas, I, I probably the most painful loss they've had all year was Tuesday night against the Islanders for them, for the guys in the room because. That one mattered so much. But even the Boston game, the Dallas game, the Toronto games, they hurt the players in the sense that they care a lot and believe a lot that they're not that far from those teams. And so when there's evidence to the contrary of seven to one loss, a 10 to four loss, a beating at the hands of the Maple Leafs in their own building, I think that gets to them a little bit more than you know okay we got a little careless against columbus we weren't quite locked in but we know we can beat that team we know you know that's so i think there's a little bit of that you know as far as i have thought especially in the last couple of weeks it would be so much better for this franchise if this season were happening eight years ago seven years ago where the drought wasn't quite what it was and people could see a little bit more clearly i think a lot of people a lot of hockey fans in buffalo understand and can appreciate the path that they're on and what they're doing and the improvement they're showing but i think there's a lot of people like jonah mentioned that are going back to that dark place. And I don't really blame those people because they're about, you know, they've got a record long playoff drought in a league where a lot of teams have passed them. They want it know. to end. They just want the misery to end. They want in it any to way, end. Shape or form. They, and the franchise needs it to end, you know, and it's, it's why it's, it's unfortunate for Kevin Adams and Don Granado who didn't have much to do with the drought, but, it is what it is. Like, this is the job you took. Like I think about it. it and they've been doing such a, they've been doing a, a good job, I think, because the strides are obvious, uh, especially since Ralph Kruger has been moved on from, uh, but with Kevin Adams and Don Granado, what they've done and the development that some of these exciting young players have shown everything with the exception of the goaltending, of course, Devin Levi's on the horizon. He's the big hope. Uh, but still, um, with the way things are going, there's that albatross that Don Granado and Kevin Adams have that they had nothing to do with, um, but they still have to cope with that on a day-to-day -day basis from an, from a, 
a fan standpoint or just from a, you know, this cloud, but that's not their cloud or they even see the cloud. I mean, it's probably healthy if they don't even realize it's there. But, I don't think they do. Well, that's good that they that they don't. Uh, it would be similar to, you know, Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean carrying that albatross with them. It is there, but hopefully they're able and 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 in times like this when they slide a little bit or the excitement wanes or they get smacked down to reality, whatever phrase you want to use uh, that uh, best describes for you what the Sabers have been going through over the last couple of weeks. Uh, that Don Granado and Kevin Adams don't feel that stress or that pressure of, damn it, uh, we need to do something. And I think that it they're not, like Jonah said, uh, because we would have seen something different probably at the trade deadline or some sort of little extra aggression or panic or whatever. But uh, it seems to me in watching Don Granado's news conference last night after the Stars game, hearing what he had to say today, hearing what the players have to say today. Not that they are uh, brushing this uh, this problematic stretch aside, or this, these last couple of weeks anyway, um, but it is a per, it's a it's a perspective, uh, a holistic perspective that they they do seem to be keeping, which I think is healthy, uh, and uh, blocking out a lot of the things that would want to drag you into a, uh, a this feeling of we are failing right now, when in fact they are still building. Yeah, I think Don Granado and Kevin Adams have been really good at detaching themselves emotionally from the drought while not running from it when they talk publicly. They know that it's there. They know what it will mean to get rid of it. They know that it's important in the set, you know, to the fans and to the franchise, but they're not allowing it to impact their thinking in a big way. And I think that's why they struck a nice balance at the trade deadline. They showed a little bit that, okay, this team has earned a little bit of a boost. We're not going to go crazy and sell off future assets, but you can trade a couple of, you know, trade a second and a fourth for Jordan Greenway, who could grow into something in Buffalo, trade a mid-level prospect for a defenseman who could help. Uh, but they didn't go crazy and make the knee-jerk move just because they're right there. And there was no move that was necessarily going to catapult them to a Stanley Cup this year. And you could argue that the moves that were made wouldn't even have made sense in the next, you know, window that they have here. You know, the the Bo Horvat, the Jacob Chikorin, you know, those types of trades might not have fit depend, you know, considering the cost. So, especially when the seat Kevin Adams is sitting in, he knows how this sport is. He knows he has the youngest team in the league. He knew Alex Tuck was going to be out for a little while. And you're sitting there saying could we go on a run and steal a wild card spot? Yes. Could we lose a bunch of games and end up with a top 10 pick? Maybe, depending on how the lottery goes, they could, you know, probably be just outside the top 10. So then you're talking about trading in a good draft, uh, a top 12 pick for a guy that, you know, is under contract for two more years or whatever. So I think they've done a good job of distancing themselves from that. And what I've noticed around the league you know other reporters and other people in the league when you talk about the sabers because they're all not in it emotionally the way the fans are they think man things are really looking up in buffalo that's the big takeaway from just about everybody is like things are really turning a corner in buffalo but they don't feel that same thing that the fans do where they just badly want it to be there and i understand that i don't diminish that one bit because it has been a long time where people want to get back on board with this hockey team. And I do think the players probably feel it a little bit more than Kevin Adams and Don Granado. And that is probably because they're young and Kevin Adams and Don Granado have the benefit of age and wisdom and experience and being able to say, you know what? We can't get ourselves too tied up with that. They're also very busy guys, <laughs> you know, with all their responsibilities where I think the you players think though, for they are, they're experienced in the game. Obviously they've spent a long time in hockey and in the national hockey league. Uh, but as 
relatively new uh, and I guess first time NHL coach, not his rookie season uh, and same with Kevin Adams, but their first jobs, I think it could be a trap for them to want to hit the accelerator and say, I, I want to experience the playoffs. I've never experienced it as an executive. I want to, I want to make my stamp. I want to, um, I want to, I want to get there. And so I could see, I think it's really been uh, uh, pretty admirable self-control, self-restraint on their part also to keep perspective when I think that they could get a little too excited about uh, let's get there. Let's, let's, uh, you know, kid on Christmas, let's open our presents on Christmas Eve uh, rather than wait until tomorrow morning. But all year long, if you listen to how them talk, uh, how the organization is talking, maybe more so than the players, but a bit of the players too. There has rarely been much talk about making a run and what they need to accomplish this season. It's all about growth and development and getting better every day. And when they lose, there aren't laments about the mistakes that cost them that game so much and things they need to do and points that they squandered. It's about whether they play the game they want to play and meet the standards, particularly their aggressiveness and offensive. Rarely have they lost the game, even when giving up 10 goals last night and really said, hey, you know, maybe we got to play a little bit better defense. You heard that a bit for the first time last night. It took 10 goals for them to be like, Hey, you know, maybe this one wasn't on the offense. Every time they lose six to four, it's like, ah, we, we missed our opportunities to win this one seven to six. And even with the trade, especially the trade deadline, there was so much talk about the future and not mortgaging the future, not doing anything to keep this team from winning the Stanley cup in the future, that making the playoffs this year, wasn't worth sacrificing anything that they're trying to build in the future, particularly Jordan. And look at Jordan Greenway. I don't think he was brought in here as much to help this team right now. It's more about what Don Granato thinks they can get out of him and develop and rediscover a game that he used to play and be a core piece for them in the future. So and I think, and, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was finished. Ahead. Well, I was just going to say, as you mentioned, it's good that they've been able to compartmentalize and maybe keep their own anxiousness to make the playoffs out of it and build that long-term strategy because oftentimes teams err in doing the opposite. I think that one of the benefits of having the youngest team in the NHL, which the Sabres have, or even if it's one of uh, the youngest, so probably over the next couple of years, uh, you can still say this uh, about them, is an attitude after a game like last night or the previous game of probably being able to shake it off pretty easily because let's just go out there and play another game, boys. You know, let's get out there. Um, they just want to play a hockey game. Uh, and at least you, you hope that's the sense. And based on from what I've heard and uh, from people that I talk to within the organization, that does seem to be a really um, rewarding aspect of, of, of the, of the team and the way it's structured right now is uh, they don't have a lot of that baggage from the past. Uh, they aren't going into that dark place like we talked about. And also they're just so young. They just want to go out there and play and make their mark in the national hockey league, which they're still doing. Even the, the good young players like Rasmus Dahlin, Dylan cousins, uh, just because they are known commodities are starting to become known commodities in the NHL doesn't mean that they don't go out there with something to prove. I mean, they're probably, they're still trying to put together a, a body of work. Uh, and so uh, I think that that does bode well for them down the stretch. I, I don't think you'll see them. Uh, I don't, I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, the stretch has been going on for a while. I guess uh, you guys are around it a little bit more. Can you sense that this is something that could hold uh, in terms of the next a uh, couple of weeks in the season here. I mean, is this something dragging on? Uh, you guys have been around locker rooms so much. Uh, do you sense that this is, are they in a funk? Is this just, I mean, what, is it just a run up against good teams? They have run into some I don't even teams. know what that question is I just said. I mean, that's kind of a vibe question, and it's probably unfair because there's really no source other than hunch or reading the reading the room type thing that that you can answer with. I mean, it was sort of my, it popped into my head last night of, man, hopefully, you know, for their sake, this doesn't cause them to come completely unraveled. Uh, because I think there's always, you know, is there anything I've picked up on that makes me think that's what's happening? No, but I think that's always a potential a potential outcome in a situation like this when you are. I the guess the point team. I was trying to make just, to, I guess, to, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but 
I think that when you get around teams that are older and have something like this happen, uh, they, they've been through it a few times and they get to a point where it's like, all right, let's just get through this friggin' season. Let's just hit the finish line. But I don't think that a young team with so much upside and so many players that people think are going to be good and have shown that they have bright futures. I don't think that they have a tendency to mail it in. I think they still want to go out and just have fun and play hockey. And it's not just, you know, let's just, I I need to get to, uh, I want to get on a bass boat or I want to get in a golf cart and, uh, and get away from this. I do think though, some of this is physical, some of it's mental with the injuries and the fatigue factor that they're at game 64 and they really seem like they're struggling to get to game 82. And that even if this was a playoff team, that it's not a team that seems to be peaking going into the uh, you know spring months of the season. And that maybe they can reverse course on this, but it really just does seem like maybe they started a little too fast to finish the season the way they need to finish to have you know the playoff positioning or the record they want to have. Well, that is also a fact, you know, an element of being young and being not having a tremendous amount of depth on the roster, which, well, you know, I un- there's people that will wonder why they didn't do more at the deadline or wonder why they didn't add more in the off season. And this is sort of the, the consequence of that is that you get to this point Alex Tuck goes down and the ripple effect starts to wear on the team or Darlene misses a few games. Samuelson misses a few games. They're playing through something and there's not other guys to really pick them up. And to your point, Jonah, I, I feel like there is an element of fatigue that has set in mentally, physically, because like Owen power is playing the most games he's ever played in his life and he's playing them in the nhl and he's playing a, a lot ton of, of a ton of minutes and he's 20 years old he's a fantastic player but there's some nights where he doesn't look it because that's just going to be what happens when you're that age i mean say matthias samuelson playing his first full nhl season uh the youth on defense is significant especially in terms of games played the age may not jump out the way it does with a bunch of 21 year old forwards but the number of games some of these guys have played is so small so i do get a little bit of a sense that you know whether it's the the rookie wall or whatever it's not even necessarily some of the the rookies but just collectively as a team the exhaustion of going through an 82 game season where the games all matter. You know, you could go through the malaise of early season last year where things were just kind of whatever, you know, the building's empty, they're get they had a ton of injuries so they're way down the standings and then they get they have something in the reserves for the end of the year where they go on that run. Digging deep to find that now when you have one of your best players missing, when you have other guys banged up, this is the mark of a playoff team, of a championship level team is that you find ways to work through that. And you see other teams around the league doing it. That the Sabres aren't at that point right now, I don't think is an indictment of them. I think it's just the reality of, of their situation. And I think what Tim mentioned about, I hadn't really thought of it that way, about older teams being worse off in a spot like this. I hadn't thought about it that way until the fall when Don Granato mentioned that when they went through their eight-game losing streak. And he said he would be more worried if it was an older team. And at first I was like, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I think you'd want an old team to have been through the experience of pulling themselves out of it. But his point was similar to Tim's. Uh, Maybe Tim is uh, sharing notes with Don. I don't know. But he said, you know, older teams might look at. I'll never tell. (laughs) He might look at it and say, oh, geez, like, here we go again. Right. We've we've seen this before. Time to just time to just mail it in and coast and get to the end of this thing here. Whereas a young team really does just want to get to the rink and keep playing. And and they have that youthful energy that there's enough youthful energy on the team that a few of them are bringing that enthusiasm every single day to the rink. And it starts to become a little contagious. Are there guys in that room right now that are feeling the disappointment 
of what's happening. I think there absolutely are, but is it a overwhelming feeling of doom and gloom? I don't think so. I, I don't think it's quite reached that point. I don't think there's a reason for it to reach that point. Could things get ugly, you know, down the stretch if they let this snowball? Yes, but they haven't done that a ton this season other than that eight gamer that was really injury related more than anything else. So it's a tough schedule. I looked at it four games ago, you know, thinking, well, they're in a tough, they're already in a tough spot because they had lost to the blue jackets and then they were playing the Bruins, the lightning, the Oilers, the Islanders, the stars, the Rangers and the Leafs. And it was like, well, that's a lot. You know, those are all other than the, the Islanders being, you know, the top wildcard contender were the worst team of that bunch. Other than that, you're talking about all teams that could win the Stanley Cup. You know, it, it would be not far fetched for Boston, Tampa, Edmonton, Dallas, the Rangers, the Leafs and the Bruins to to win the cup. The Islanders. <laughs> might be more of a long shot and but so and those are teams that are going to get to this point in the season and raise their game and be even more on top of the details and so that is the this is the path the Sabres chose it's a path that Sabres fans have wanted I think for a long time things done properly the right way with patience and with drafting and developing and so it's more than okay for fans to feel the impatience and to feel disappointed and frustrated but i think it's okay and healthy for the team to not feel that way because they are still when you zoom out so much better off as a franchise than they were when don granado took over and i think that's an important piece to keep in mind that does not mean that they don't have a ton of work to do this offseason and some serious hard decisions to make maybe not even difficult decisions but serious decisions to make about aspects of this roster you know who is their goalie it's a huge question going into the off season what do they do on defense you know are players like victor olofsson part of the future or do you need to make room for an outside addition or uh you know a prospect to to come into the room so they have to start to use everything's an evaluation but they have to really use these games that matter the meaningful march games they have to keep winning, first of all, to even be able to call them meaningful March games because they're slipping into not meaningful territory. But those are the games that might tell you even more about when we needed guys most, who was there, who stepped up, who didn't. And so there are definitely big picture questions about this roster that need to be answered. I just think in the grand scheme of things, everything is still pretty much on schedule with, with you know, what people were hoping for at the beginning of the year. I'd say there's a distinction between the disappointment or frustration in the locker room is about a team that in its second or, or third year in its current in, in incarnation didn't hit the high expectations or isn't, isn't ready to contend now. It's not about a team that's in year 11 or 12 of its playoff drought and carrying the baggage from previous teams and previous regimes and previous players that came up short. Within the fan base, it's obviously much different. You know, I think that's the first prism through which a Sabres fan or even a casual Buffalo sports fan views the team is, are they going to make the playoffs? Are they finally going to end this drought? It has a lot more to do with any individual game or other storyline surrounding the team. But, you know, I just wanted to make a quick point on that. Coming up on, it's been 10 years since Darcy Regeer kind of sat there a couple of years into the playoff drought and said, that the Sabres fans need to get used to some suffering, that the team is no longer just going to be trying to just make the playoffs, that they're going to bottom out and do some things to try to be a Stanley Cup contending team. So now they're 10 years removed from that. They've been through the tank for Jack Eichel, and, and everything they did was designed to have a Cup contending team, not a team that just gets the eighth seed in the playoff and ends a drought. And it, while it is maybe frustrating that it's continuing along that trend, if you take Kevin Adams and Don Granado at their word and you believe in their vision and you listen to them saying that they seem almost assured 
that this is going to be a championship level team in a year or two or three, then I think you do have to continue to be patient with this team not ending its playoff drought now because that's not the end goal. So if the team makes the playoffs next year and then it's a championship team the year after, I think it's okay whatever happens this year. They can lose as many games as they need to down the stretch as long as it doesn't derail the development toward where they're going in a year or two. I agree. It's 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 not easy to look at it that way all the time. And, you know, I also try at times to remove myself from the fact that, of course, I'm watching every minute that these guys play and I'm in the room all the time and I'm listening to every word Don Granado says. And hockey is not a sport that every single fan consumes that way, <laughs> unlike football is to an extent you know where you're consuming everything and you're watching every single game uh there are a lot of hockey fans like that uh you know that watch every single night but uh it's a it's a commitment to be able to do that 82 games a uh, random tuesday night or you're staying up you know for a late game i think even some of the most dedicated fans probably miss a a 10 30 puck drop against the coyotes or whatever but so I do understand if you're you're kind of dropping in, it's like, okay, Bill's season's over. These guys, you know, late January get hot and start making a run. Then the all-star break happens. And the little things over the course of a season that you could point to and say, yeah, that's a young team. Like that's, that's a, a problem and a mistake and a stretch that a young team would go through after the all-star break, struggling to get themselves going again. Uh, this little stretch that they've been on, losing a game to Columbus, that stretch they had where they lost to Philly, Seattle, and and one other team in January, all at home, all pretty lifeless performances. You know, I think that is you know some stuff that that young teams w figure out and go through. I think I think some of these players do feel the drought a little bit. I think some are probably relatively and healthy, have a healthy, you know, ignorance to it. But I think some of them, Alex Tuck mentioned in, he and I were talking in LA and we were talking about why they were so good on the road. And he brought up at home, you know, he said, I think at home, he said, I've never really thought of it this way but now that we're talking you know the the pressure to okay the building is full if we lose this game they're not going to come back it's kind of like this thing that has it's been a, a thing this year right the attendance when are fans going to come back yeah. when are they going to win back the fan base and that's just human nature that's just like psychology that that's going to creep in Dylan Cousins, I remember in a preseason video, I think it was uh, one of those, like, maybe it was like a ride along with Marty or one of those embeddeds that they do. He mentioned, man, it's going to be great when we're the team that gets this place full again. And he's mentioned that in other interviews. And there's other guys that have mentioned that. And so that's something that they probably care about as much as ending the drought. It's all tied together. And so I do think there is an element of, pressure that they're putting on themselves to be that team that does that for Buffalo and for this fan base. So, but again, all healthy things to go through all healthy things to be like, man, this is the first time any of them have felt this and that will matter next year when they, you know, it's a much better experience than if they were out of it right now completely. And if they were never in it to begin with, that is a much different thing. But I compare it to the discourse around the Ottawa Senators and the Detroit Red Wings right now, where around the deadline, now granted, Ottawa went out and got Chikrin. Uh, they were pretty pumped about that, and they feel like long-term that's going to help them. And the fans there aren't super concerned about whether they make the playoffs this year. The fans in Detroit don't seem overly agitated about whether they're going to make the playoffs and both of those teams spent money in free agency and added big pieces. And then, you know, Ottawa makes that big deal. And I felt that the deadline, a lot of angst 
over from the fan base, Kevin Adams isn't doing anything. What's he doing? He's sitting on his hands and he's not, he's not putting this team in a position to go and get that playoff spot where I think other fan bases that have tasted the playoffs in the last 11 years, look at the Eastern conference and say, man, there is absolutely no way my red wings or my senators are getting out of the first round of this mess. Like, yeah, it's fine. Just improve, do what you can. And I think Sabres fans know that they know that they would probably get their ass kicked in the first round, but they want that. <laughs> they want to, they want to get to the first round. Right. And I get that. They want to, they want the party in the plaza, right? They want the, the home playoff game. They want to show off what a hockey town this can be. Hockey and heaven. Like they want that again. And I get that. I mean, there's been tastes of it this year, but the big picture is, is really still pretty, pretty healthy. And this will be a huge off season of decisions from Kevin Adams and Don Granado. And then the expectations, if they think they were dealing with learning how to have expectations this year, just wait until next year when the rest of the hockey world has loved looking at them this year, loved watching them and, and seeing what's, growing and developing their own fan base has gotten a taste of what it can be. The expectations will be playoffs next year. Absolutely. No matter how this season finishes. So all of this is just preparing them for that. And it feels in some ways like, you know, for them that, that is, it's like a, a dress rehearsal for when next year is going to be, ramped up expectations but still with an eye towards like they're going to be they're the youngest team in hockey and they have craig anderson on their roster who is right i believe the oldest player in hockey or right up there with mm-hmm. with mark giordano so like well let, assuming let me he ask retires, you about the average uh, age is going to go down right uh, real quick man i want to talk about nfl free agency also because that starts up uh, early next week um, Matthew, take me behind the mask. Um, Eric Comrie allows 10 goals on Thursday evening. Um, what's the reasoning behind that? I know you've talked to Don Granado uh, a couple of times uh, after the game. And then today at practice, uh, you know, what's, you know, he didn't get pulled. Uh, he's out there for all 10 of them. Uh, how do you come back from that? What's the thinking? I mean, just the whole, if you, uh, I don't know uh, if you can tie it in a bow, but what about it? Yeah. I've unfortunately, I think let up 10 goals in a game uh, before more than, <laughs> more than once, maybe within the last six months, who's to say uh, <laughs> My, uh, a little my goals, different. Yeah, a little different in uh, in men's league um, where the goals against averages hover closer to the double digits than they do in the NHL. But, you know, it's very hard to put myself in the shoes of a NHL goaltender. But I think but when you've gathered about as much information as you can and talking to people after yeah. the game, the reasoning behind it, does he bounce back? Was he OK with it? Do you think he's embarrassed to the point, you know? Patrick Waugh needed to be traded after he got up. What was it? Six or seven, uh, that one time, um, because he was humiliated. His coach left him out there too long. And I mean, is, is Eric Comrie feel humiliated? I don't know. Haven't had a chance to talk to Eric Comrie. He wasn't in the room, uh, when we got in there this afternoon, or if he was, I was talking to somebody else. Don Granado's reasoning I thought was okay. It was a three nothing game and they thought about pulling them. Then it's a three to one game. And so then you're kind of in it. And it wasn't as if these goals were all his fault. Then it's a five two game after two periods. You get the first goal in the third. It's five to three at that point. And so I do understand to an extent. So then the stars just start pouring it on, right? And at that point, you have a couple. There's of no celebration line at some point. The, the stars right. are almost feeling uh, uh, guilty yeah. uh, for scoring these goals. But some of them were some egregious breakdowns. And Kyle Ocposo said it, you know, like 
that's like a lesson you learn when you're eight years old that you leave your goalie dry. And frankly, they did it sort of two times in a week that happened in a similar fashion against Boston where they sort of, it was a close game. They let up the empty netters and then they let up a couple of bad goals late. That was UPL in the net. So uh, it's a, it's a good question that I don't really have an answer to, I guess is my, All right. I, I well, think it's a, okay that they kept him in. Can he bounce back from it? I don't know because honestly he doesn't have a huge track record in the NHL. And so this whole year has been really tough for Eric Comrie. This is, this was supposed to be his shot to be a starter. This was supposed to be his chance to get a ton of games. That was the plan. You know, UPL started in Rochester and Eric Comrie was going to get the net and Craig Anderson would play once in a while. Then he gets hurt. Well, he had to play behind all those injuries during the eight game losing streak and had some tough games because of it. Then he got hurt and missed quite a bit of time. And when he's come back, he has barely gotten the net. And so he came into last night having won four games in a row. And the first of those wins was on January 24th or 5th, the week when they were in Winnipeg. That was the first win of that winning streak. And the last win of that winning streak was uh, the lightning game. So it's like, that is like a month and a half of playing four games. So then he goes in there and he lets up 10 and he has to eat the whole thing. But, are you at that point saying, well, it's Thursday night. We play a few hours earlier on Saturday. We don't really need to, you know, might as well let UPL save his legs if he's going to play, you know, on, on Saturday against the Rangers. I guess it's like you're, you got a tired bullpen, right? And you're like, sorry, you got to go out there and just keep getting rattled around the yard because we got to save our arms for the next night. I don't know if it's the same situation with a hockey goalie, but. It is a very, you know, Jonah and I were talking about this after the game last night, after we filed, just what's next for Eric Comrie? Like, how do you come back from that? When does he see the net again? Um, and not only when does he see the net again, but then what does that say? Because that's a big decision going into the offseason. Craig Anderson probably doesn't come back. He's probably going to retire. I don't think they want to deal – you know, deal with the whole three goalie thing again. And that's almost the reality of your situation when you have a goalie only playing like once a week. Has UPL done anything that makes you think he's a surefire starter, future starter in the NHL? He's shown signs. Has Eric Comrie shown you that? Not really. Devin Levi, probably going to play a year in Rochester, assuming he signs. So what do you do? You know, at that point, you need to go out and get a goalie, but uh, that's a long winded and, you know, side conversation to how the hell does Eric Comrie pull himself right. out of that? Honestly, I don't know. It's uh, it really sucks that he had to sit there and especially at the end when it seemed like guys kind of mailed it in a little bit and packed it in. And um, I mean, I don't want to say they mailed it in. I don't think the guys completely quit, but the defensive focus was just gone at a certain point in that game obviously you let up 10 goals and Kyle Ocposo said it so I don't need to they they hung him out to dry and that's got to hurt for a guy that has been nothing but the A plus teammate start to finish like one of the nicer guys in that locker room constantly one of the last guys on the ice so that everybody else can shoot and get extra work in the ultimate you know, teammate when UPL came in and played well while he was injured. And so he took a bulk of his minutes and the job wasn't waiting for him when he came back. The way guys talk about Eric Comrie when he wins a game, like they love it. And they did that to that guy. So that's, that's not great. But I think like everybody else, you get back to the rink and, you know, I saw Eric Comrie today. He didn't see him down in the dumps he's a real positive guy so if there's a guy that can shake it off and you know get back out there I, I feel like he's probably the one I don't think they from their perspective have much of a decision to make in goaltending or they think perceive that to be the case I think they're really looking at it like UPL and Eric Comrie are the goalies for next season and Devin Levi and maybe a fourth goalie Malcolm Subban that's the plan going forward. And if it blows up in their face a year from now, maybe then they make a goalie move, but I wouldn't expect 
much of a change. Eric Carmi's under contract, and it, it, he really serves no purpose as the third goalie right now. They don't need to rotate three goalies. They don't need his starts. He he could they could be just fine with Craig Anderson and UPL. They're playing him because he's going to be on the team next year, and they want to keep him engaged and not quit on him now. And if he goes down to the minors, they wave him or whatnot. Then he's not there for them when they think they might need him a year from now. I'm not convinced they won't make any move, but I do think I think fans should probably not expect a major, major goalie splash. I just don't. I think they do have to. I wouldn't have thought this a month ago. I think a month and a half, two months ago, I would have said, you're probably okay with UPL and Comrie. But I think in a year where they know they're going to be expected to make the playoffs, they have to they have to at least look around and, and see what's out there. They almost traded for Matt Murray at the draft last year. He didn't want to come to Buffalo. So that deal fell through. But that was but before they signed Comrie. That was before they signed Comrie. But they did only sign Comrie to a two-year, $1.8 million. It's not nothing, but it's not like they went out and got John Gibson at five million, or you know, one of these goalies that's making five plus million, or like Jack Campbell or something. Which, and that's the other goalie is the weirdest position in the league in terms of evaluating it. Even when you have a guy wondering whether he's going to continue to be the guy uh, in John Gibson's case or Jack Campbell's case in Edmonton, he may not even be their playoff starter, and he was their big free agent acquisition last year. So. I think they need to think about it and look at it. But the reason people were talking about doing it at the deadline and there was no way they were doing it at the deadline because A, you already have three goalies. What are you going to do? Like, how is that even going to work? But B, they did not want to give the appearance at all that they were blocking the net. Like Devin Levi still has not signed and they do not want to do anything to jeopardize or even put a hint of doubt in that situation. So there was no way they were going to do that. But I think it's a matter of it probably hinges a lot on their plan for Levi, because if they think one year is enough, then maybe they they white knuckle it and try to get by with UPL and Comrie and hope UPL takes a jump and and Comrie's better after a healthy offseason and, uh, you know, can stay healthy next year. But I just don't know. I don't think you can go through the off season and not at least give that situation a real hard look because that is going to be one of the biggest variables in their success next year. We know they're going to score a ton of goals next year. They need to play better defense. And if they're not going to be a perfect defensive team, if they're going to play run and gun, if they're going to be up and down the ice, they're going to need a goalie to steal some games. And they had it for a brief period this year. Craig Anderson has stolen some games. On paper, yeah, it makes sense to go UPL and Comrie, whatever, with the the money and the contracts. I just think they got to look at it. And UPL will be in the NHL next year. I believe the way his contract works is it was two-way this year and one-way next year. So, and I think you, he's done enough that you want him in the net next year. But I think Comrie is probably the bigger question. And it's not his fault. Like I said, he's... I feel badly the season's gone the way it has for him, but it's the reality. And it is why I think you need to get him back in the net at some point to say, what do we have in these two guys? Because the reason you're rotating three right now is because you don't have one. If you did at this time in the year, you'd be going with the one a lot. And they're rotating three and playing Craig Anderson as much as they possibly can. So probably a good, uh, a good way to lead off the off season discussion when we get there, because I think it's a, it's a priority to at least evaluate that spot. Well, I speak from experience at some point you get tired of white knuckling it. Uh, and, uh, you got to, uh, figure something out. Yeah. Um, you want to grip the steering wheel a little more loosely, you know, you want to relax cruise control. The uh, Buffalo Bills uh, at free agency uh, last year, Brandon Bean said that uh, they weren't going to do anything. No big splashes. Uh, All they do is sign uh, Von Miller, the future Hall of Fame edge rusher. Um, It didn't quite work out. 
uh, he clearly was a good signing. Uh, it just uh, didn't work out uh, because he couldn't hit the finish line. Uh, the knee injury that he sustained, uh, Bill's defense uh, suffered, uh, of course. So it wasn't a bad signing. Uh, I think that they got the right guy. They got the guy they needed from a leadership standpoint, plus the production. Uh, he just couldn't stay healthy. Uh, Brandon Bean again this year saying don't expect much and the salary cap numbers seem to indicate uh, that that would be very difficult to do. Uh, the Bills have enough of their own players to resign if they want to, uh, but even if they don't, they're over the cap. Uh, they have a bunch of moves that they need to make financially. Um, guys, uh, I know that uh, even though uh, hockey has been what we're most con uh, concentrating on here over the last month, you both uh, uh, cover the National Football League. Jonah, you still do. Matt, uh, that was all you did for several years. So I know you have thoughts. Um, what would be a surprise for you? Um, well, let's see how I want to phrase the question. Basically, what I want to ask is, uh, what's the over-under on uh, how high your eyebrows ra uh, raise on your, on your foreheads uh, when the Bills make the biggest of their big moves? I'd say I have no idea how to answer that question, but I, I want to say zero because I don't think the Bills are going to make a big move, but I also think they are going to make some move where you might raise your eyebrows and say, mm, I didn't really realize they could afford. There to could be that. a cut that they well, make. It doesn't even have to be a signing. It could be somebody that they have to let go because they can't afford it. We're seeing teams around, uh, around the league uh, uh, releasing. Yeah good players because it's a salary cap move, not because they, they, uh, they don't want the guy on their team anymore. Yeah. And I, and I don't think the bills will cut anybody better than like Isaiah McKenzie or Tim settle or something like that. Some of the moves that everybody seems to be predicting really what the player they're going to sacrifice is Tremaine Edmonds and or Jordan Poyer because they don't have the money to resign them. But the difference between last year and with Brandon being saying they wouldn't be big spenders and they ended up being, is Von Miller's presence on the roster. And Brandon Bean said that in his post season press conference, that that was a multi-year splurge and the way that contract set up that they cashed in a year ago and don't have the ability to keep doing that as long as Von Miller is still on the books. And also Josh Allen's extension kicking in, changed the cap math significantly. And, and they're no longer a team that can spend a lot of money in free agency and a lot of money to resign their own free agents. They have to be much more prudent but I do think you can sign guys that it seems like you can't afford. Anybody in the NFL can do that because of the way you can restructure contracts to create cap space in the present that gets pushed into the future. There's the a deal. little bit of hocus pocus, but then there is yeah. also this feeling because there has been hocus pocus in the past that the salary cap is like a figment of everyone's imagination, that it's barely real, but it's very real. Um, and you can you there's all kinds of ways that you can do it. Uh, and I, I think one of the one of the more notable ways was what the New Orleans Saints did when they had Drew Brees. They kept kicking the can down the road, kicking the can down the road. And then at some point you have a smoking crater. Uh, there are some teams that like to shift on the fly a little bit. Um, like the the New England Patriots have tried to do that. Uh, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers, now that they're in the post Ben Roethlisberger era, they're trying well, the to Saints somehow the Saints somehow go out and get Derek Carr now. So it seems like the can is just well, they've also down not the had road. Drew Brees for a little while. Yeah, I mean, it's not like not Drew Brees good. just retired. Right. Yeah, I mean, they're not that they, good anymore, but they like, went with Jameis Winston for a little while. I mean, uh, there were there were people who were arguing that Taysom Hill was the best quarterback on the roster. So I think would, that the I think the Saints did go through their, they paid their the piper re, a readjustment bit. phase. Yeah, you, you would have felt uh, like the way they were handling the cap that they deserved like a decade of cap jail, but they, they, that's right. That they there was a long... it, uh, pretty good. And yeah. now they got Derek Carr. So they were able to, you know, figure things out, but, but they also had one shot at a super bowl. They played in one super bowl. They won it. Um, but drew Brees, I mean, they had the, one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time and they managed to appear in one super bowl. Uh, and they won it, yes. So they have that Lombardi Trophy down there uh, in a in a case at the Superdome for everybody to walk past. So yeah, they've got their uh, their big bauble. But I mean, it, it, that's one thing that I think I like to warn Bills fans about. Uh, that uh, I think that there's this feeling 
uh, because the Patriots and Bill Belichick and Tom Brady kicked him in the teeth for so many years in that long playoff drought that, okay, here's Josh Allen, Tom Brady's gone, uh, the AFC East is wide open, we now deserve our Super Bowls, um, whether they win them or not. I think it's just we deserve Super Bowls. We are owed this. Great teams aren't owed uh, anything. Uh, you know, so the Bills can be great and still not make it. The Saints are proof of that. We got all kinds of quarterbacks you can point to. Dan Marino, oh, Dan yes. Fouts, Warren Moon. I mean, hell, Peyton Manning. Uh, it, you you can you could probably have a very good case that he's one of the top two quarterbacks in NFL history. You could probably make a case that he's the greatest in in football history. Uh, and he didn't exactly roll up a bunch of Lombardi trophies. And and one of them, uh, he he was along for the ride. Uh, because the Broncos had such a great defense. Uh, so anyway, that's just my way of saying that um, uh, there are all kinds of ways to, to handle your cap. Usually it has to do with your quarterback, and Josh Allen's going to get a huge chunk of that. Um, three names on offense that I find particularly intriguing. Uh, number one, Derrick Henry. And the reason I think so is because I don't have any inside information about him coming to the Bills. But he is the betting favorite uh, of all, or the Bills are the betting favorite to be the team that Derrick Henry goes to. I don't think Vegas has inside information yeah. either. I think that's just a feeling of that's where the money's going to come in. Uh, and that's where teams or where people who are going to bet on such a thing can best envision him going. A team that needs a running back, a good team, where would he want to go? Therefore, the Bills add up in the betting algorithm as the team that's going to get the most money put on it. So can the, you actually bet on that, by the yes, way? Yes, you can. Yes, you Where? can. I've seen that. Right. Uh, that's like at, um, you know, this uh, Bovada and uh, Bet US and all these types of things. I always There's assume those are just like PR ploys. And um, I always no, wonder no, if that's, anybody those actually are, bets on those things. Exactly. You can bet that's, on that. You can, but does any real, actual living, breathing person do that? I bet they they are just PR things just to get headlines and stupid blogs and podcasts to talk about. Well, I think I bet you people bet on it. I mean, if they offer the line, people are going to bet on it. Um, You have to be a real sucker with a lot of legal with a lot of legal sports books. Now, I do wonder, you know, a lot of states legalizing the mobile and and the and the sports books like. How many people are you the amount of people using Bovada has certainly significantly decreased and which probably means those bets by extension have decreased. But well, I let do- me see if while, while we talk about them, I'll see if I can find a couple. Also, um, betting on the favorite is a stupid bet in some of these situations, unless you're really certain. But, you know, Derek Carr, that was, you know, a bet that could be made. Where's Derek Carr's next team? Aaron Rodgers' next team. That's a bet. Uh, uh, let me see if I can ex- actually find it uh, just for the sake of, you know, but uh, let me throw out two other names for you guys to, to uh, roil around. Um, Adam Thielen, uh, cut today by the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, I think that he'd be a perfect fit for the Buffalo bills. Uh, can they afford him that? I don't know. Uh, did Stefan Diggs and he get along? I don't know. Um, and then of course there's Odell Beckham jr, which is still out there. He had a tryout today for teams. So he had an open tryout. Um, and the bills have long been connected with him, uh, because Von Miller has been, um, touting it. Uh, there've been all kinds of different uh, hints and Odell Beckham Jr. himself has, you know, teased it a little bit that he would like to, you know, w- check out the locker room there. Uh, see, so sit next to Von Miller and has uh, had Bills fans uh, geared up uh, about that. Now, can the Bills afford any of these guys un- with, under their situation? I think, again, it's, it would have to take some hocus pocus. And, I think, um, but I think anyway, they yeah, will go ahead, get, Joe. well, I just want to say, I, I think they will get Maybe one of those guys, a name or two like that, that on paper you think, wow, the Bills can't afford that player. But they're going to get somebody who is an established player in the NFL at a lower salary who sees the talent and Josh Allen particularly and wants to play on this Buffalo Bills team that a lot of people thought was the best team in the NFL for long stretches of last season and a team that's going to win the Super Bowl at some point or going to be a contending team. Similar to what happened with Von Miller, but he got a big contract. And the, part of the hocus pocus, you can do this with new contracts where it's a big contract, but the bonuses are spread out and it doesn't really have a big hit on the current cap. So I could see whether it's Thielen or OBJ or somebody like that, um, you know, that eyebrow 
raising type move happening, but not costing a lot of money. Is Thielen even going to get that much money? He's not that good anymore. Well, maybe the Bills get him at the minimum. I don't know if they can get him at the minimum, but I don't think he's going to cost a tremendous amount. I think he's going to cost less than OBJ, probably. He turns 33 in August. He's not that type of receiver. He's not, you know, big downfield threat. Uh, He's more, uh, you know, the close to the line of scrimmage. Yes, he did only have 716 yards last year. That's in a 17 game season. Um, you know, that's, uh, he down from 1373 in 2018, but he does have 30 touchdowns over the last three seasons, 14, three seasons ago, 10, two seasons ago, six last year. Um, he's, uh, he's a reliable receiver. He doesn't drop the ball. I think it would be, uh, and a that's useful one act. thing that would be crucial. You know, f- that's one thing he's. He's the thing that has kind of been missing from this offense. And if the bills were so desperate for that type of receiver, a possession receiver that they were to, you know, yank uh, Cole Beasley off the couch, uh, you know, Hey, get out of the rap studio and get in here uh, and try to catch some footballs for us uh, in down the home stretch in meaningful games in the playoffs. uh, Then I think they can find uh, a place for, for Adam Thielen on the roster. So yeah, you're right, Matthew. Uh, you take a look at his age, his recent production. Um, he's a, he's a guy that the Bills probably could find room for. Yeah, I don't think he would be expensive, and I do think he would be useful. I think it would be kind of a sweet spot of what the type of move they should be looking to make and the type of player and person they should be looking at who is in a stage of his career where he wants to win a championship and be a part of an offense that puts up numbers and all those things. So they're now in a position where they can attract a player like that and be on his short list where five years ago they weren't even on that list. So is he the Adam Thielen of three years ago? Obviously not, but he probably doesn't need to be on this Bills team to find some value. Now, as we've seen in the last handful of years, those receivers that they think don't need to fill those roles end up needing to uh, until they find somebody to step up opposite Stefan Diggs. You end up leaning on the veteran. You end up leaning on Emmanuel Sanders or John Brown or Cole Beasley off the street. And so it's a Gabe Davis question that you ask yourself is, can Gabe Davis be good enough that you don't need to lean on Adam Thielen and you can pay him you know, lower contract, throw them in the slot and, you know, see what you get. But uh, that's the type of move that they're going to, I think that's the type of market they're going to be spending and is what discount can they get for being a Super Bowl contender? Which the Patriots used to do so well for so long in finding these guys on the second wave of free agency that the money dried up and, and they start picking the team where they have the best chance to win instead of the best contract. But I think what you mentioned there about Gabe Davis, the Bills are in a point with the way they've built this team and this roster and the number of players they have under contract and the cap situation where they can't expect, the fans can't expect free agency to be the answer for any shortcomings. I think that they're going to sign some players, they're going to fill a few holes and and fill out the roster, but whether the Bills fulfill their potential or get any better next year really I think is going to come down to developing their current players um, the draft picks that they make and getting good value out of young players on rookie contracts, coaching and having a little luck and, and really just winning with the team they have. I think after that Von Miller signing and the big Josh Allen contract, they're out of the big spending business and they need to do well with the players that are already on the roster. They need to develop a guy like Isaiah Hodgins and not lose him to another team, have to wave him and have the Giants right. turn him into a good player. So there's players on the roster that maybe some Bills fans aren't high on or have given up on that the bills need to find ways to get more out of or or develop them into the needs, filling those needs. And, you know, I I was talking about, uh, you know, the saints because uh, I'm, I guess I'm too old to actually uh, think of things that have happened more recently. I, I I recall things uh, from a few years ago, as an example, Uh, if I want to uh, talk about how real the salary cap is, I don't need to go that far back in my memory. I can go back to, Oh, 12 months ago in the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, 
the salary cap, very real, mess. very real in Los Angeles. Um, they, they, they went all mess. for it. They were fortunate enough to win it. Uh, but then they had to detonate a Super Bowl roster as it started to fall apart based on two big, you know, heavy duty contracts. And now they, you know, that Sean McVay is no longer the genius he was uh, uh, 12 months ago. And so do the Bills fans really want that? It's almost parallel to the Sabres discussion. Do you go all in to win that long awaited Super Bowl, but then you have to well, cut that, everybody and start over? Or do you? And that's the great bar, an bar room contest? question, right? It's the great, but it's the great question. Would you trade? Would you trade one Lombardi Trophy uh, for being a perennial contender and having a chance every year, but the likelihood that you don't? Uh, but what would you rather have? I think that there is a. I would rather, as a fan, no, I'm not talking about Bills, but any team. I would rather be a team that's so good that we might win it every year, and maybe not, uh, as opposed to blowing your wad and then saying goodbye to it for a long time. Uh, you know, it's like, um, well, this isn't quite the example of it, but I remember watching, and I'm going to have, I'm going to forget his name. Uh, the New York Mets pitcher seven or eight years ago threw a no hitter. Um, you can Google it uh, for Jacob me. the Gram? No, 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 no. Is the first no hitter in Mets history. Johan Santana is, am I mixing up my guys? Sounds right. Well, let me just and, Google first. Don't hear it. And I was Why? watching and I, who is it? Johan Santana. Yeah. Johan Santana. And I was watching it and he, and he threw, and I don't know, Jonah, if you have it there in front of you, as you're looking that up, he threw like 130 pitches or something. Like he was gassed, but he was throwing a no hitter. And I remember tweeting during the game I was watching and I said, Mets fans, what, what would you rather have? Uh, this guy throwing a no hitter or him be done for the rest of the season. Oh, and it was you una- borderline unanimous, no hitter, no hitter, no hitter. This is history. We've never had it. And sure enough, Johan Santana, whatever it is you may have there in front of you, Jonah threw however many pitches and he was wrecked. Not only for the season, he's pretty much, he was pretty much done as a, as a major leaguer. So I'm having right? trouble finding the number, but it's described as Herculean pitch count. Yeah. So whatever it is, 134 pitches. Okay. So You're my out. memory wasn't too far off. I mean, not quite. I mean, a no hitter is not the same as the Lombardi trophy, uh, but uh, it's, sim- it, it's a similar concept. Of what well, would it's you also rather different have? because uh, Mets fans are probably thinking, whatever, you know, he's, he was kind of old at that point and they're all like, we can, <laughs> we'll live. But that we'll was a playoff no caliber and... team and they needed him down the yeah, stretch. They did. And, and uh, I think a lot of uh, people would take the Lombardi. I think uh, around here, a lot of people would take the Lombardi. Uh, they've, but they, I don't know. But they're wrong. Most people would, but I think they're wrong. I think you will, f- you would find that that dopamine hit from winning one time doesn't last forever. And that being a team with a chance to win over and over, and over again and be a perennial contender. I mean, it's a what about that just one before I die mentality? Just one, just well, I it just is, one. It's an, it's an odd premise because the idea that you're going to be a contender for years and years and years, a lot of people would take that and say, well, eventually we'll get one. Right. So they're still actually just doing it for the chance of getting the one. Right. So that's why I think most people would just pick the one. Say you could guarantee that the bills are going to be in the playoffs every year for the rest of your life, but they're not going to ever win. The point is to win. So they're going to want the Super Bowl. You know, I, I think most people, heck, you could be like, okay, yeah, maybe like Jonah says, you, you win the Super Bowl and the dopamine hit isn't as good as you thought it was. And you're like, well, you know, I actually don't need to watch this anymore because I've tasted it and it's not that cool. So won the Super Bowl and I'm all set. Whereas if you're just in perpetual chase, I don't know. Maybe that would be more entertaining. I'm trying to think who's a football team that was like a one year wonder, won a Super Bowl in the 90s or or so, maybe like Tampa Bay in the early 2000s. And then compare that to the Bills that lost four Super Bowls in a row. I kind of think the New Orleans Saints with Drew Brees. Just use that example. Yeah, but the New Orleans Saints were good with Drew Brees here. They had both. They they won and they they won all they won all the time. And then they got the one Super Bowl. It's like the Packers were a perennial threat but they only won one Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers. Is that a waste? I don't know. It's hard to win a Super Bowl. You know, the Patriots have made it seem like you can win all these Super Bowls and then the Chiefs are doing it, but it's hard to do that. And so 
is it a failure to only win one Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers? Maybe, maybe that's an organizational failure. Maybe it's a failure on the part of Aaron Rodgers. I don't know, but still, that's just the reality of pro sports for a lot of teams and a lot of fans and a lot of players is that it's not that easy to, to win one. And they're not, as you said, Tim, you're not owed them. You're not, you don't deserve them. You're not given them like a lot of weird stuff has to go your way unless you have a superhuman talent that can catapult your team like a Tom Brady or a Patrick Mahomes. And maybe the bills have that, but you know, that remains to be seen. All right, let's uh, let's. I want to wrap up uh, Johan Santana here with uh, just a quick because uh, my memory and Matthew calls me on this quite a bit. I am I am gr- I am brilliant at coming up with half an anecdote or two thirds of an anecdote uh, that is really great to me, and then uh, we come to find out that I didn't quite remember it. I was I was close, but not on the bullseye. With Johan Santana, I was pretty damn close. Uh, So this happened in 2012, uh, and he threw his no-hitter on June 1st against the Cardinals. Um, Yeah, 134 pitches, 77 strikes. Um, But here's the thing. Uh, After that, he lost seven of his next 10 games. And his last five games, he gave up this many earned runs. Seven, six, six, eight, six. Uh, the eight uh, was in one and a third inning, uh, and he was never heard from again. He never – that was it. That season was it. He didn't even come back next the next season, none of that. The last game he pitched was 10 outings after his no-hitter, and then that was all. But the Mets How old got was their he? no-hitter. How old was he? He was – bear with me, I'm sorry. It sounds like he got a little cocky and was reading his own press clippings. He was 33, but he, he was only two years. He was two years removed from, well, he had been an all-star one, two, three, four of his previous six seasons. Um, two years prior, he'd led. Uh, in fact, he led the league in ERA three of the previous seven seasons. Uh, now again, 33 Your pitcher. Sometimes you fall apart, but that's what, what's what happens when you send a 33 year old out there to throw 134 pitches. You shouldn't do it. You should I not vote, have done that. I vote no on it. But he pitched a no-hitter. All right, Jonah. Uh, basketball season. We're still here in March Madness. Let's get the uh, Jonah Bronstein, New Bronstein Times basketball report. But let's start here. Let's start with an incredible statistic coming from the Damon Women's Program. Well, yeah, Damon Women went to the NCAA tournament for the third time in a row. They had previously won two games there, but they lost this morning. But going into the tournament, even coming out, shooting guard Paige Imborski, the leading scorer on the team, New Fane native, played at Niagara County Community College, transferred back home from Abilene Christian, a Division I school in Texas, leads the country in three-point shooting. Anybody want to guess the number? Even though I already told you out the air. Well, what's I a know good what number? it is. What's a good Man, number, though? It's hard for us to guess the number when you told us the what's number. the John? highest number you've ever heard? If you were to tell, and what was the it, one the you season? told me right before it's for the, the season, season. Right. <laughs> for the season, if you were to have said she broke the record, Tim, what would you guess? I would have said 48%, which is excellent three point shooting. That's like shooting 72% inside the arc, which nobody does. Well, she finished the season at 59%, was at 60% before today, went two for five, 40%, you know, big swoon down to 59. Um, that is. Division two all-time record for women's basketball, the highest shooting percentage total, three-point shooting percentage total in all the NCAA, Division one, two, three, men's and women's, obviously Damon record. And not only that, but the Damon men who didn't make the NCAA tournament, they also have the Division two three-point shooting percentage leader, Andrew Mason, at about 52%. It might be something with those rims that our friend Mike Morano has been tightening up in the gym, but these Damon kids can really shoot the ball. Wow. So 48% is not even, wouldn't even be close to the record. I mean, 48% could lead the country. I think if you look through it with some of these, I mean, that's, you know, record wise, no, I think the best seasons are usually over 40. I do think with the NBA, you don't have too many seasons. The all-time record might be somewhere around 48, 49%. And Steve Kerr's, I think maybe 50, but not much higher than 50 or 55. Steve Kerr's all-time 
percentage is about 45 percent, and nobody for a career shoots anywhere close to that but Stephen Curry oh, now I sound ignorant I mean I've never attempts? heard of 60 percent 60 percent is shoot? unbelievable 110 attempts through 25 games so she's good. shooting a good number not jacking them up like crazy some of this is shot selection she's not taking bad shots which is partly the reason why she's always making them but she's an excellent shooter she was an excellent shooter back at no shit. college, college. <laughs> yeah all right but always been a he's all right actual shooter 42 percent when she played at N Triple C and worked on her game, but also being a fifth year college player coming from a division one down to a division two, just really understands how to get open, find the shot that's going to go in and not take a bad shot. That's going to be a low percentage look. And, and another, I, I just think interesting with her story, being a local, being from new fame, being, having come through that, that championship program at N Triple C. She's from the Beeline Nyland coaching family. John Beeline's her great. I was just going to say, there's a, is there a new fame connection? I think there's a family connection with the Beelines and the Nylons and the Capons are another name. And then Imborski is another name in that um, basketball clan. And just being a good player that's not terribly athletic um, and not terribly, you know, big and, you know, not a division one sized player, but that jump shot is what got her into division one basketball. And then coming back here playing with Damon, you know, I, I've never seen anything like it. Not even, I think in high school, a player that's shooting a lot and going a whole season and shooting. Not even Joe Licata? Not even Joe Licata. Not even me in the Gloria Parks leagues when I've had some of my, you know, sweet shooting summers. I, I think I've had some 50% summers, but 60% is practically unheard of. She shot 40% or better in every game but one this season, and the only one she was below, it was 37%. What about the rest of the big four, Jonah? Well, the big four is dwindling to you know, the only right one. Now. The Niagara men play tonight. They play at 6 o'clock against Iona here on Friday night, You know, an hour and a half after we're recording this. And they're the only local Division One team left to play. They're in the semifinals of the MAC tournament. The Niagara women were alive up until we started recording this podcast. It was you know a tight game in the third quarter into the fourth, and they ended up losing by 12 points to Manhattan. Um, they're out. UB men were out last night. UB women made their heroic march to be in the eighth seed, and then they lost in overtime against the number one seed. They're out. Canisius, both teams lost their opening games. Bana, which made a coaching change today on the women's side, both of those teams lost their first game. So if the Niagara men don't take care of business against Rick Patino and Iona tonight, there won't be any local teams playing in March Madness or even reaching the finals of their conference tournament. Is that a nine o'clock tip? The Mac usually plays at like a nine o'clock. I think this game is six o'clock. They Ooh. played late last night. It was a nine 30 tip, but ESPN news, I believe is the television network. And that could watch be a that. good game. I, I don't really expect Niagara to win, but I think they could play well and make a game out of it. And maybe should we play. have some beers and watch the game, Jonah? At six o'clock. I don't know if that's going to happen, but. You know, it's still the work day. I still got to break some stories. And uh, I know, see, I see. I'm on vacation. Five o'clock news. I got to put something out there that everybody's going to be talking about on the air later. I just want to state for the record. I looked it up. I knew he was a great three point shooter, uh, but I didn't know what his numbers were. So my cousin played at uh, Indiana. Uh, Pat Graham, not Greg Graham. Little uh, that he's from a, a different family. Uh, but Pat Graham uh, is my first cousin. He shot fifty seven percent his senior All year right, for the Hoosiers. Okay. Uh, I almost debunked Jonah's uh, stat. That would have been bad. Started 15 to 28 games. Well, the thing with Pat is that Pat could shoot uh, not too swift, uh, not too uh, light on his feet. Um, Matthew Fairburn has seen Tim Graham play basketball. And, brief, uh, it was a brief. It was. It didn't go well. It was brief. I was very, well. the antis, it was kind of, you know, like, it was kind of like the conversation we're having of would you rather your team compete for 10 years and have a chance or would you rather win the one Super Bowl? I wish I could have just had the anticipation of watching you play basketball forever. And then I actually saw it and it only lasted like a minute. And then yeah. you, were, you were down and out with an injury and number of times. Well, I think it was the repeated breaks I needed. It wasn't, uh, it's true. Yeah. I, I was good in spurts. Um, it was Which like a, a story Santana of my life. performance. If we had make, made you play the whole game, right. 
you never would have played again. And my actually, knee, you probably my, haven't. My knees kept going out on me when I first went for a loose ball, and I thought to myself, and I went for it. I mean, I ended up hitting the tur- hitting, the, hit the, hitting floor. the hardwood, and I thought to myself, "Well, Tim, you don't need to be going that hard for it," because I thought it was an instinctive thing. And then the next time there was a loose ball, I just flat out fell down, and I thought I didn't dive that first time. I thought I dove, I didn't. Uh, I think my my knees uh, and my legs were uh, couldn't keep up with the uh, the what was between the ears. It was still it wasn't it was good. Still a good time. It was a good time. All around. it was a good time. This was at the Hoosier Gym uh, yeah. where they filmed uh, where they filmed the movie, the History Hickory Huskers Gym. My favorite combine that I've ever been to was that one. That was on the way out to the combine. I don't remember much about the combine, but remember. Just lots, lots of friendship, starting with that basketball game. Uh, it was a yeah. good trip. We've also could, got, uh, in local sports, not to jump on Jonah's beat, but Canisius and Niagara play a little hockey. hockey. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were getting, they were girding their loins for it at the Harbor Center this afternoon. Canisius loins was fully the, girded. They were is that on tomorrow the ice night? For, it's tonight. Tonight, it, tomorrow, and possibly Sunday. Yeah. There is going to be a good luck parking if you're going anywhere downtown. For the next couple of days there's the bandits tonight along with the college hockey there's high school hockey going on at harbor center tonight and tomorrow with some uh, several the teams bowman cup tomorrow. well that's in april but um oh. sabers play tomorrow afternoon and so the canisius game the high school game the sabers game all going to happen around the same time tomorrow afternoon i so, thought I mean, the bowman uh, there was a bowman okay there yeah, was a play. great was, scene of the, uh... april 10th it was a pretty great hockey scene at the Harbor Center today. You had Canisius had their morning skate. You had a bunch of high school teams in town. And then you had the Sabres were relegated to their back rink, the the back small rink. And they had a bunch of fans watching and just felt like a felt like a real community rink today. It was uh, it was nice. I enjoyed it. Like the old the days at the old Pepsi Center. I enjoyed those. Well, yeah, whatever it, it just, is now the north had all the high school kids running around and they got a bonus treat because the rangers practiced this afternoon patty so canes and patrick town. kane was in town now not all, these, Kaner. not all these guys are you know western new york hockey fans but probably some ranger fans um you know even uh excited about patrick all right kane, this so. podcast has gone on way too fucking long <laughs> <laughs> but for i just those looked at listen all whose fault the is that get that easter egg there i think all of us <laughs> Uh, okay, let's wrap this shit up. Uh, I'm willing to get together and watch any of these sporting events on television with you guys uh, over beers, if you'd like, or coffee. I mean, I, whatever you wish, whatever. Uh, but uh, anybody out there, uh, you have a tendency to know where to find me. Uh, find me. And, what coffee, uh, beers what coffee on me. shops? What coffee shops do you frequent? No, no shops? coffee shops. That was a red herring. Uh, if you pop into Elmo's and I'm there, uh, say hello, uh, uh, beers on me. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody to, uh, for listening to Tim Graham and friends brought to you by CTBK CPAs and business consultants. CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach that takes on each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills to provide creative solutions for their clients based right here in Western New York. CTBK is a champion for your business in our community. Additionally, CTBK goes beyond tax and attest services by offering a wide array of consulting and outsource solutions tailored to meet the unique needs of your business, allowing you to focus on your operational and long-term strategic goals. Whether you're a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, the team at CTBK is determined to help you succeed. Visit ctbk.com or call 716 716- 630-2400, 716-630-2400 to learn how CTBK's one-team approach can work for you.